Thank you very much, Elke, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me to the seminar series and every one in the virtual audience to come and join. Yeah, just because you started mentioning it, I'm compared to probably most people in the audience, I'm actually more like a Wookiee in the cyanobacterial world. So I have done my PhD in um, civil environmental engineering on PCB contamination and toxicokinetics into sediment drilling worms. <laughs> and then I did a, a postdoc period in the Natural History Museum in London and at ETH in Zurich, where I studied photochemistry of micropollutants, enzymes, amino assets. Yeah, and only since five years, I'm a research group leader in the environmental chemistry department at EAVAC. It's a Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, and we are within the ETH domain, but we are a research institute. And there I work on the environmental behavior of biomolecules. I still work on extracellular enzymes, micropollutants, peptide-based pharmaceuticals, for example, but then also cyanobacterial metabolites that we want to talk about today. So what I prepared for today is a one, a two-parted talk, like roughly two times 15 minutes. And I want to introduce our work about the database, CyanomedDB, that we have some developments where we want to help improve the confidence in identifying cyanobacterial metabolites. And I particularly work on cyanobacterial peptides. And then in the second part, I want to show just some work we do on environmental fate studies of cyanopeptides in, in my research group. So I get us slowly started to warm up. We, of course, also start with the known toxins from the World Health Organization. As of this year, we have a few more on the list. We have cylinder spermopsin, anatoxin, and saxitoxin, in addition to microcystin or microcystin LR that you see here. Um, but we also all know that there is quite a longer list of other metabolites that cyanobacteria produce and alone for the microcystins around the core structure, we have the variable building blocks and the peptide that is indicated by the small legend here to some extent. And when I started this work, I thought, oh, well, they, I know I started weeding and I knew there are many more metabolites or peptides, not just the microcystines. And then I looked also uh, really great reviews about the biosynthesis machinery of cyanobacteria. And when we look at the other cyanopeptide classes, we find a similar pattern of this core structure like the microcystines have. We also see that in cyanopeptolines, anabinapeptines and other peptide classes. And then they have this interesting part where we have variable building blocks and suddenly the diversity seemingly explodes because we have so many different variants of, in this case, cyanopeptides and then of course also all the non-peptide based metabolites. And in my early start in these projects, I really struggled with finding good databases or lists of the known metabolites that one should consider if we want to extract and analyze cyanobacterial samples. And then something we then often discuss is, yeah, well, are those maybe not as relevant? Are they not as abundant or persistent or toxic as the WHO toxins, for example? And a bit of the problem is that you just not have as many studies as we have for the microcystines for all the other metabolites. So we just don't know as much yet about them to conclude some of these aspects of persistence and toxicity. Here, which is also interesting, it's not like we are done by having some final comprehensive list, because on the left, we see the cumulative number of compounds that have been identified over the last year. So these are the publication years of the references. And in green, we see that we know more and more microcystins over the years, but we also see the number of compounds in these classes keep increasing. And we wonder how much more are we going to identify in the next decade. So we have to really keep track of all those compounds being put out there in the literature. There's also on the right side, a, a small summary, not comprehensive, but for some cyanopeptide classes, just as comparable to microcystins, we find that they can inhibit different enzymes. And blue, those are mostly um, peptidase inhibitory concentrations, IC50 values that from the literature. And then we also in green have some data on uh, lethal concentration 50 for a certain crustacean that has been tested for different representatives of these classes. So they certainly are bioactive, these compounds, and they also do occur in impacted um, surface waters. Here are two studies that looked at one at um, lakes in North America and one at um, lakes in Europe. I think I already saw some of the authors in the audience. And this is just a summary where we wanted to show from the 
few studies that we have that the total concentrations of total cyanopeptides in the gray box plots is significantly higher than the identified microcystins in the green line of the same samples, of the same lake samples. Um, of course, this is not necessarily comprehensive because both studies only quantified compounds that they had reference standards for, so for prominent microcystins, but they also were able to include some anabenapeptines and cyanopeptolines. But we see overall the green portion, the microcystin is not always dominating and the other compounds can be co-produced in significant concentrations as well. So we have many, many compounds. They are bioactive. They do occur in the waters that we care about when we study cyanobacteria, but we have not as much information about them yet. And in my eyes, the big challenge are the analytics, especially if we have amazing microbiologists and ecologists working on cyanobacterial work. Oftentimes, targeted analysis from the chemical point of view is more feasible to also include in these already quite interdisciplinary and com complex studies. But if we want to study a more comprehensive range of metabolites, you really need to have more specific analytical workflows that then often are left to the environmental chemists or chemists to optimize and not always make it into all the great projects that are out there about cyanobacteria. So the, the challenges we see from the chemistry or the analytical chemistry side when we created CyanomatDB two years ago was, first of all, we had not even a comprehensive, openly accessible list of the known secondary metabolites, including their chemical structures, because you need the chemical structures for your analytical workflow. And you don't find analytical reference standards to commercially buy for most of these compounds. So maybe 1% of the compounds that we know you are able to buy a reference standard for. And even if they are available, they are really quite expensive. So it's not feasible for everyone to purchase these standards. Without standards, what we often do if we analyze micropollutants, for example, you don't necessarily need the standards always, but you have to have reference data available online, like analytical mass spec reference data or something similar to compare your measured samples with. And also this is not available for most of the metabolites. So this really puts a um, limitation on the analytical options that you have if you study cyanobacteria. So we started with this first challenge with uh, the CyanomedDB team. So you can see our team here. Um, these are uh, a really diverse range of different researchers across the globe. And it's a, it's a great team to, to work with since 2019. We kind of do this on the side. None of us gets paid for, for this work or has a funded project to do this, but it's amazing how dedicated every single one of them was to put the database together. And what we did is we took our private list. So this is also something I learned quickly. Every lab that works on cyanometabolites has a list, but it's private because it's very valuable that you have it and you curated it to a certain extent. But we really opened all our lists, so we merged them, collated them with other openly accessible data from databases that are freely available already. And then for this master list for each entry, we curated, verified, or added the primary reference. So the reference that really identified the compound in the first place. So we have more than 850 references that are associated to the metabolites starting from 1967 publications. We then went and checked and in most cases added the structural codes. So we drew all the molecular structures and generated different structural codes, initial keys, and so on. And um, we mostly rely on the SMILES codes in, in the database now. And for almost 1700, we had stereochemical information that we could consider and have isomeric SMILES for those compounds. One thing we notice, and I'm not part of that research community, but I want to urge people who really explore and identify new metabolites, if they publish these discoveries, it would be very helpful to not just have a printed structure, but also have one of these structural codes, like, like a SMILES code published with that publication. That would really help to avoid a lot of error that happens if you then later manually have to go through and redraw the structures. And even having a somewhat electronically available mass spec fragmentation data would be quite helpful if you don't already upload it to an open access repository. But this is CyanomedDB. This is the list that is now available. Here's a little impression of the chemical space. It's 50 Dalton bins on the, the x-axis. So you see it ranges from 150 to more than 2000 Dalton and the number of compounds in each bin. 
we have somewhat classified metabolite classes, like the green portion here are the microcysteines, but we also sometimes just declare them as other linear non-peptides, other cyclic peptides, if we didn't assign a certain class to them. We kind of fixed our attention on the most common classes, so to speak, but this is something we can also keep working on and improving. Where you can find and use the database is one, we have the water research article to find more information, how we generated the database, what it contains, and some examples, what we think it could be useful for. And we also put the actual data file on the Senodo repository because it allows us to publish and upload um, future versions. If we have an updated version, we plan that for next year right now, you will find it on Senodo as well and can download it for free. Um, so these are the two references that would be helpful for us if you um, refer to those, if you use CyanomedDB content. However, we have implemented the CyanomedDB information in other larger data sets or data online platforms, like we collaborate with PubChem, the Natural Products Atlas Group, the list is on the Norman List Exchange. We also have collaborators at the MedFrag Predicted Fragmentation Catalog that you can find for all the entries in CyanomedDB. At the same time, so we try to just disseminate the information wherever we can. It's open accessible. I mean, we also help these different platforms to implement it the correct way. But we still think it's a big value to have the CyanomedDB standalone because it allows us as a cyanobacterial community to have all the metabolites in one place. You don't need to filter through these other platforms. And you can also rely on this being really manually curated. We usually have a 4i principle Every compound was looked at and checked by two of our authors. However, we also know there are still errors. It's never perfect. And we, we keep working on this, of course. I want to give you an impression what the next steps are in CyanomedDB. So in my lab, we use this database for our LCMS analytical workflow. So we do target analysis where we have standards. We do suspect screening against the CyanomedDB suspect list where we don't have standards in the lab. What we typically do is we have sample or an extract of biomass and the 10 milliliter aqueous sample can be injected to online solid phase extraction system. So here we enrich these 10 milliliters on an SPE cartridge on a PAL instrument and then clean it up and elude it into the LCMS. On the MS side, we mostly use QExectives. We work a lot with the Orbitrap Fusion Lumos, but now also with the Explorers instrument. And this is where the CyanomedDB comes in. So here we use this as a transition list where we trigger MS2 fragmentation if a precursor in CyanomedDB has been identified. And then we search against the CyanomedDB suspect list in our data processing. And the challenge really is that we have so few compounds where we can do targeted analysis with and then suspect screening. If you don't have reference spectra in a database that you can compare your measurements to, you really have to work hard to increase the confidence that you identified the correct compound. And just to illustrate this a bit, this is the identification scheme by colleagues in the department I work at, by, uh, published by Shimansky et al. They set this up for identification of micropollutants, but we use it the same way for the cyanopeptides or cyanometabolites. So it means if you start on the bottom with, at low confidence, if you only have an exact mass of your precursor ion and you can maybe assign a molecular formula to it, you are on level four. But if you really want the highest confidence level, level one, you need to verify your LCMS data with an authentic reference standard. And if you imagine having a sample that contains a whole range of different metabolites, typically a small portion, in this case, a few micro common microcystins where we have reference standards for, we can really identify with this high level one confidence level. But so this is a log scale here. The majority of our compounds, we don't have reference standards for to start with. So here we can search against CyanomedDB from the MS1 information. And maybe we get to level four that we know from the molecular formula what tentative structure we can have. And really to move at least to level two before you would purchase an expensive reference standard, if that is even available, you really need to do some more in-depth MS2 interpretation of your data. So for example, if we have this uh, master charge ratio identified as a feature in our LCMS run, CyanomedDB can help us look at what compounds might have this molecular formula in the database 
So in this case, we have two very similar anabinapeptines um, that really just vary in some parts of the, the color part of the molecule that I highlighted. And if you have a comprehensive database of reference spectra, you would compare your MS2 spectra from your sample to that data you can access in a database. So on the bottom here, this would be the MS2 spectrum of a sample. So that would be the same on the left and the right graph. And then you could verify for each of these potential compounds, which mass spectra matches the sample. So even without going through the in-depth analysis, you can tell by eye that on the right-hand side spectrum really matches the sample better than the other one. And with some more quantitative verification, you can then say you identify this compound on level two of the identification scheme. And this is what we want to generate with the Cyanomet DB team in the next step. So we keep curating the suspect list because we know it's far away from perfect. We keep adding and correcting compounds on it. And we start now to systematically collect the analytical reference mass spec data. And we try some uh, retention time indexing as well, and then deposit that also in open access platforms so people can cross check their analytical data more easily. So also a little shout out here if people feel like they can make a significant contribution to the suspect list or generating reference data, please feel free to contact us. We are very happy to collaborate or see where we can improve our work. This was the first part. So I uh, really have been passionate about working on this database because the team is just really fun to work with. But we also then have to do science with the database. The database itself isn't fulfilling enough yet. So what I and my, my research focus on is I use these analytical pipelines to study um, peptide profiles. So I mostly work with cyanopeptides and I'm interested just to see what the production dynamics are, what different peptides are produced together from a certain species or in a certain lake. And then from these more abundant peptides, I, which is my, my previous core research field is environmental fate processes. So I study the photochemical fate and also biotransformation of cyanopeptides. And then we have this better understanding of abundance and also persistence of these peptides and regarding surface water quality, but we also collaborate with um, drinking water authorities that use the uh, lake water for drinking water production. And I don't do this by myself, but in collaboration with the Environmental Toxicology Department at EAVAC, we also use these abundant and persistent compounds to see what mixture or subgroups of cyanopeptides may cause toxic effects. And here we look at ecotoxicological effects in aquatic organisms. So I call those then these priority substances because as there are so many, it's very hard to decide which ones are the most important ones. But based on my context, I look at abundant and persistent compounds that, that are in my interest. And now what I, I thought I'd do in the, the last portion of the talk is I show you a little bit about the fate processes that we study. And to give some context, uh, I don't know how many people are in the audience from Switzerland, but we also have cyanobacteria in Switzerland. When I started at EAVAC, I, I thought, oh, well, I'm, I might have to find field sites outside of Switzerland. Everybody has this impression of the Alps, the water castle, it's all so clean. Well, well, it's not all so clean, not in terms of micropollutants, and we also have natural toxins. So these are some examples. We study um, have a study site in Lake Zurich, where Plantotrix rubescens is seasonally active and abundant. We study this, particularly this lake, in collaboration also with the University of Zurich, because there's a great linology department working on Plantotrix rubescens specifically, but we collaborate here also with the local authorities um, that produce drinking water from Lake Zurich. Lake Greifensee is a lake that is very close to our research institute and it serves us as a model lake that has microcystis in it, but also other cyanobacteria. And we have a monitoring platform there and a decade long of monitoring data from the ecology department at Erwag that we collaborate with. And maybe a um, more prominent bar example is the Lake Neuchâtel. So last year we had very temporary uh, surface water bloom there where dogs played in the water and interacted with the water and six of the dogs died within 24 hours. Of course, this always gets this media attention, but it also just shows that Switzerland does have cyanobacteria and depending on the development of these lakes, it might or might not become a bigger problem in the future. And the local authorities are not so alert or aware of this problem because it hasn't been particularly threatening in the past, but now they're also collaborating um, with us and other institutes to put in better action plans and be more prepared and aware of the situations in, in the Swiss lakes.
All right, so the photochemical part is where I study the fate is outside of the cell. So I'm only doing studies on extracellular metabolites when they are released from the cell in, in this, these cases. We do study sorption sedimentation and enzymatic biotransformation, but the work I wanna show you today is work on photochemical fate in the surface water. This is a bit the workflow. So we try to work with a larger range of compounds. So we start with cultured biomass um, that we harvest. So we have mostly pure material. We then clean up the extract. And for the photochemical studies, for us, it is most important to remove the major pigments that would interfere with the photochemical tests. So we do prep LC uh, mostly to um, then have not single compounds, but we have purified solutions that we spike into our transformation experiments. We look at different environmental conditions, and today I thought I showed something about half-lives in sunlit surface waters and the effect of pH on these transformation rates. And then we use our common analytical pipeline with the cyanomet DB for our suspect screening. Um, in this um, screening study, we used four cyanobacterial strains. Um, we were able to um, look at the phototransformation of 54 cyanopeptides that gave from the quality a good enough signal that we could monitor it over time. And we really just asked the question of how much of these peptides is removed in the surface water. And here we use the Lake Reifensee as our model lake. So we used that as our matrix in the microcosm studies that we did in the laboratory. We exposed it to simulated sunlight for reproducibility. And we really just exposed it for three hours of this sunlight in lake water. Here you can see um, one data set of one strain, Microcystis aeruginosa, the relative abundance of each peptide. And the top bar is the total 100% abundance of the sum of all the peptides. Here it's a bit hard to see, but this little orange sliver is 2% because we all, this indicates the removal within three hours of the total peptide pool. So most of the cyanopeptides in Microcystis aeruginosa were persistent. Here are the results of the four other strains, another microcystis strain, Dolicospermum floss acra and Plantotrix rubescens. And we get up to 28% removal in three hours of sunlight exposure of the sum of the, the peptides, depending on the strain. But you also see that many cyanopeptides were stable in our experimental setup, which is a fairly short exposure. Only two peptides degraded really fast, but 24 peptides had kind of like an intermediate reactivity in the sunlight. In this publication, this came out a little earlier this year, we then also looked a bit into the pH effect that we started to see quite quickly. So this is an example of anabenapeptin B, and also still in the lake water, if we modify the pH of the native lake water from 7 to 10, we see that at pH 7 or 8, it wasn't really degrading. It was one of those compounds that showed degradation, but slow degradation around neutral pH. But then we see a quite significant increase of degradation when we increase the pH. And we know the tyrosine, or in this case, homotyrosine moieties, their photochemistry is pH dependent. So we first of all know in our pH range, we have speciation going on that we get a larger portion of the phenolate form. And this is representative for many lakes where we actually expect an elevated pH during the, the blooming season. Typically also for micropollutants, many photochemical studies are done between pH 7 and 8. So they always say quasi neutral pH as their reference condition, where you would then conclude that anabenapeptin A is mostly stable. But if we are at pH 9 or even higher during a bloom event, we get significant amounts of these phenolate that are more reactive. We know that they are more reactive in the literature from just studying freely the soft tyrosine as the more building block that we have here in the anabena peptine. So for once, the light absorbance of tyrosine increases at higher pH, so the phenolate increases at a slightly higher wavelength. This is not so important in sunlit surface waters because the sunlight only starts around 280 nanometers and that UVB light is only really penetrating the very first layer of the water column. So there is a pH effect from direct photolysis, but what we were more interested in here is the pH effect on indirect photochemistry. So not the anabena peptine itself absorbs the light, but other organic molecules absorb light and create reactive oxygen species that then react with our cyanopeptides. And one very abundant and potent reactive oxygen species that is photochemically produced is singled oxygen and deprotonated phenol. So phenolates react with singled oxygen at, at a much faster rate. So we know this from studies of tyrosine as the amino acid freely dissolved. And we know this also from several studies of phenolate containing micropollutants. 
So we looked at that in a bit more closely for the cyanopeptides. And we made an artificial setup to selectively study the reaction with signaled oxygen. So here we used a UVA light reactor and we used a photosensitizer pernaftanone that if it absorbs light in its triplet excited state, reacts with signaled oxygen by energy transfer and creates signaled oxygen. And then we could study the reaction of signaled oxygen with the different cyanopeptides. In the UVA light alone, if we take the sensitizer out, all the compounds were stable. They were not degrading. Only when we added the photosensitizer and we created signaled oxygen, we saw transformation of the parent compounds. So here you see in blue the two anabenapeptines that are degrading, but they are degrading only half as fast as compound three and four. And the difference is that all of them have in blue this homotyrosine moiety but compound three and four have an additional tyrosine. And um, this is kind of expected if we think tyrosine is the main reactive site with singled oxygen, that two targets in a molecule will roughly give you twice as fast observed reaction rates. And then we did the same experiment, but along the pH gradient. Now we went from seven to 12, and we can nicely see that the observed transformation rate from the reaction with singled oxygen nicely tracks the speciation curve. So this further verifies that the main reactivity comes from the deprotonated phenolate form. And the rate that we observe in our experiments that K-OPS, the, the observed reaction rate, is a combination of all the photochemical processes that may occur. But we could verify that direct photochemistry without photosensitizer is not happening. And the reaction with single oxygen is the product of the bimolecular reaction rate constant, how fast the compound can react with single oxygen, times the steady state concentration of single oxygen of the oxidant in solution. And we then measure these bimolecular reaction rate constants for seven different cyanopeptides because those are system independent rate constants. So as soon as you know your single oxygen concentration in the surface water or maybe in an engineered water treatment system, you can calculate how fast a compound would be transformed based on this reaction pathway. So here we use the kinetic solvent isotope effect method studying the kinetics in H2O and D2O. It's a standard method in photochemistry to measure these biomolecular weight constants. And we did this only for the phenolate form because we already proved that this is the reactive moiety. For the seminar today, I stop here on the photochemical details. So we also went into um, these K other processes that are also contributing to phototransformation of cyanopeptides. And here we studied triplet excited organic matter that also shows a pH effect that is very significant. Um, but I decided for the sake of time not to go into more detail today. What I want to show you instead is um, this uh, small addition is all the 18 cyanopeptides that contain tyrosine or tyrosine-like moiety, similar to this anabinapeptine. I think we had 18. They all show the same pH effect. And it also is very comparable if you compare this to how freely dissolved tyrosine as an amino acid reacts. So here you see the bimolecular reaction rate constants over the speciation of dissolved tyrosine or an example cyanopeptide that contains tyrosine. And you can see that they behave quite similar. To finish, I wanted to give you some outlook what we are working on. And we actually have a couple of new projects and new positions in, our, in my research group. So at the heart of my interest is still these studying these fate processes. So we continue work on this side. We also start a, a quite different project on cyanobacteria in the Swiss Alps. So here we study um, cyanobacteria that are in com lichen communities in these ink lines. German, we call them Tintenstriche, these wetted parts on the rocks in the Alps. And we are interested in the genetic and metabolic diversity of the fungi and cyanobacteria that populate these sites. So we are recruiting currently a PhD student and a postdoc for this project. There's another project where we look at ozonation as a continuation of previous work on microcystins by Urs von Gunten, a colleague of mine at Erwag. And together with Urs von Gunten, we now study ozonation processes of a wider range of multi-class cyanopeptides. And this project is in collaboration with the waterworks in Zurich. So we study conditions in the Lake Zurich, what is reaching the drinking water treatment plant, how are these compounds behaving during the drinking water treatment and conduct particular laboratory experiments on ozonation kinetics. And we are also recruiting a postdoc for this project starting by the end of this year, roughly. And the last project is a very um, large interdisciplinary project in collaboration with microbiologists, ecologists, and me from the environmental chemistry side. 
Um, here we really look at a model lake from the genes to the ecosystem effects to understand why toxic cyanobacteria often dominate or when and why do they dominate. So we have studies that are conducted in the lake and mesocosms, but also in the smaller microcosms in the lab and are recruiting um, three different PhD students by the end of this year or based on who we can recruit. Yes, and with this, I um, yeah, just like to thank you all for listening patiently, and I hope there are some interesting discussions that we can have now afterwards. Thank you.